morning. And welcome to worship here in the Old Kirk. And a warm welcome to those watching online and to those listening to the Dial a Sermon service. One or two intimations just to draw your attention to. Uh, a reminder that um, tomorrow at 2pm at the crematorium it's Isabel Gilchrist's funeral, if anyone would like to uh, attend that. Also next Saturday, uh, sorry, next Sunday, uh, is our car treasure hunt. Uh, I'm assured that it's uh, only uh, a radius of two and a half miles from the manse, so you can't get that lost um, if you wish to come along to that. Two o'clock at the manse next Sunday afternoon, and then a, a barbecue afterwards. If you haven't put your name down, if you put it down on the list uh, today, that would be very helpful. Um, also, just a reminder um, for the news I gave last week, that um, Sharon, our secretary, is uh, retiring, um, or at least she's moving full-time to the presbytery job that she's doing. And so we decided we would have a um, presentation, thank you, the word went completely out of my head, uh, a presentation for her. And if you'd like to make a donation towards that presentation, then you can do so over the next couple of weeks. If you just put something in an envelope, write Sharon on it, and you can either put it in the plate or uh, leave it at the door when you come into church and then uh, we'll arrange a date where we invite Sharon to the service and we'll make the, the presentation. Also, just a huge thank you to everyone who was involved in the service yesterday for the Yeomanry and their 225th anniversary. It was quite an occasion. Um, the parade through the town was uh, something to be seen. They had six white horses um, with the parade. Uh, it really was quite special. And then we had the service here and they were absolutely delighted um, with the service. So. Um, thank you to everyone who uh, helped steward at that yesterday. The rest of the intimations you can read at your leisure. We're going to sit quietly as we remember the folks in Ukraine. Thank you. We sing, Brother, Sister, Let Me Serve You.
Let us pray. Almighty God, so wise and powerful that none can stand against you, we praise you. You are stronger than earthquakes, storms, and raging seas. Open our eyes to an awareness of your power. You know the secrets of the atom and the vastness of outer space. Open our minds to your wisdom and creativity. Your love is so deep that you know the innermost secrets of all your children. Open our hearts to you as friend. Powerful and loving God, you bring all things under your rule. All monarchs and presidents, all ministers and officers owe their allegiance to you. So we ask to see your glory, a glory shown supremely in your Son, to whom you gave all authority, and a glory which can be reflected in the lives of all whom Jesus calls. Lord God, you are our strength and our salvation. We confess our lack of faith, especially when we have doubted your power to achieve your purposes. We confess our ignorance and our unwillingness to learn more about you and more about ourselves and others. We confess our sense of loneliness and failure, our feeling that there is no one who can help us with our problems. So too, in silence, we remember this past week, the hurtful things said to others, the hurtful things done to others, as well as ourselves. We confess to God Almighty and to the whole company of earth and heaven that we have sinned in thought and word and deed and through what we have left undone. Lord, have mercy upon us. And here is now as we say our family prayer together, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now I'd like to ask Kate to read our lessons. The readings this morning are from the New Testament. And the first reading is Matthew chapter 18, verses 23 to 35. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. The servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, cancelled the debt, and let him go. But when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. The fellow servant fell on his knees and begged him, be patient with me and I will pay you back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I cancelled all the debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant? just as I had on you. In his anger, his master turned him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all that he owed. This is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother from your heart. Here ends the first lesson. We sing, God forgave my sin.
And the second reading is from St. Luke, chapter 19, verses 11 to 26. While they were listening to this, he went on to tell them a parable, because he was near Jerusalem, and the people thought that the kingdom of God was going to appear at once. He said, a man of noble birth went to a distant country to have himself appointed king and then to return. So he called 10 of his servants and gave them 10 miners. Put this money to work, he said, until I come back. But his servants hated him and sent the delegation after him to say, we don't want this man to be our king. He was made king, however, and returned home. Then he sent for the servants to whom he had given the money in order to find out what they had gained with it. The first man came and said, Sir, your miner has earned ten more. Well done, my good servant, his master replied. Because you have been trustworthy in a very small matter, take charge of ten cities. The second came and said, Sir, your miner has earned five more. His master answered, You take charge of five cities. Then another servant came and said, Sir, here is your miner. I kept it laid away in a piece of cloth. I was afraid of you because you're a hard man. You take what you did not put in and reap what you did not sow. His master replied, I will judge you by your own words, you wicked servant. You knew, did you, that I am a hard man, taking out what I did not put in and reaping what I did not sow. Why then didn't you put my money on deposit so that when I came back, I could have collected it with interest? Then he said to those standing by, take his miner away from him and give it to the one who has 10 miners. So they said, he already has 10. He replied, I tell you that to everyone who has, more will be given. But as for the one who has nothing, even what he has, will be taken away. But those enemies of mine, who did not want me to be king over them, bring them here and kill them in front of me. The Lord bless to us this reading of his holy word, and to his name be the praise and glory. Amen. Thank you, Kate. We sing How Deep the Father's Love for Us.
words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, Father, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. The minister had been invited to preach in a small country church. As he arrived, he noticed the plate for the offering was at the door, and he decided to put a pound in. At the end of the service, the treasurer approached them and confided that they were a poor congregation and that it was their habit to give the preacher the contents of the offering in lieu of pulpit supply and expenses. The minister agreed, but was rather upset to discover that all he was given was a pound. When he complained to the treasurer and explained that he had put the pound in, the treasurer replied, the more you give, the more you receive. This morning I want us to think about the story of the talents recorded in Matthew's Gospel and the story of the king as recorded in Luke's Gospel. And these stories are obviously different accounts of the same parable told by Jesus, adapted and changed to suit the situation that each writer was addressing. A talent was a weight of metal, probably silver, and would have had a value of around £240 in today's money. Luke changes the talent into money, and the amount reflects the community he was writing to. Matthew was writing to a far richer community, hence the higher values involved. Luke's account also reminds us of that this parable was based on a true event. In 4 BC, Herod the Great died and left his kingdom split between Herod Antipas, Herod Philip, and Archelaus. And for any or all of them to claim the, the, their inheritance, they had to appeal to Rome, because the Romans were the overlords of Palestine. Archelaus went to Rome to claim Judea, while the Jews sent a delegation to Rome asking that Rome refuse his claim. But the Emperor Augustus granted it, but refused to allow Archelaus to call himself king. So what do these two accounts teach us about the stewardship of the soul? Firstly, we are reminded that we each have different gifts and that those gifts are differing in value. No two Christians are the same. Nor does God give them exactly the same talents or attributes. Some have more in gifts in one area, but less in another. We are all different because God has different roles for us to play in his plan. So we should never think of ourselves as being in competition with each other as Christians. We are not in a race to see who gets to heaven first. We're not equal in talent, but we ought to be equal in the effort that we put into using and developing our talents, and that is the key to understanding what happens in these stories. God gives us different, different gifts, but he expects each of us to use those gifts to the best of our ability, to use every effort we can. Any judgment in how we have done isn't based on the amount we achieve, rather on how far we have come with the talents that we started with. For example, if we began with one talent and end with five, we have achieved more than someone who began with ten talents and ends up with twenty. God is looking for committed workers. People who, matter, no matter how limited their talents might be, are prepared to put in the hard graft of building the kingdom of God. And on that basis, every single man, woman and child in this church today ought to be actively involved in working for God. Using the skills and talents that God has given you to the best of your ability. And it doesn't matter where your skills and talents lie, you should be using them to build the kingdom. We should also note in Luke's version that God doesn't stand looking over our shoulders watching our every move like the king. He gives us space to use and to develop those talents. He trusts us to use our talents and skills wisely and for the benefit of others as well as ourselves. He doesn't direct our every move. He allows us to make decisions for ourselves. Some good, some bad. So the first lesson that we have to learn is that in God's eyes we are different. But he trusts us equally to do our best 
whatever the gifts he has given us. Secondly, we have to remember that in both stories, the people are being tested by their masters. They want to see if their servants can be trusted in small things before they give them greater responsibility. Before God allowed Jesus to become the saviour of the world, he tested his son to see if he would provide for his family as a carpenter. Only when Jesus proved that he was up to caring for his mother and brothers, did God then place the responsibility of saving the world on his shoulders. If God is testing you in a small way now, it's because he wants to see if you are ready for something bigger in the future. When we prove to him that we can be faithful in the small things, then he'll trust us with the big things as well. The question we have to ask is, are we being faithful in the small things? Most of us here have taken vows of membership in this church. But are we faithful to them? I'm sure that if I was to ask each person sitting in the pews this morning, do you love God? And do you accept Jesus as your Savior and Lord? Then you would all say yes. At least I hope you would. But what about the other vows? Are we faithful in coming to worship on a regular basis? Gordon Reed was my minister when I was younger. And I remember him telling the story of a young couple who came to him to see if he would marry them. And they were having a discussion and Gordon asked the, the young man, are, are you a regular attender at church? Oh yes, minister, yes, yes, I go every watch night. Some people think that is regular attendance. But are we as regular at church as we should be? Do we read our Bibles and pray for the church and the world in the privacy of our own home? Or is it just when you come to church that you fulfill your vow? And what about offering our time and talents and money? The very fact that in the past we have had to have stewardship campaigns to raise our givings would suggest that at times we have failed to give a fitting amount of our money to the work of the church. And the fact that we're always looking for volunteers for this or that suggests that not all our 500 or so members are giving a fitting proportion of their time to the work of the church. And until we are faithful in these small things, God is not going to richly bless us. Until we have proven ourselves worthy, God is not going to entrust us with great tasks in the scheme of things. So if we want to see this kirk, if we want to see this congregation at the center of God's plan for air, then we need to put more effort into the basics of our faith. We need to believe that God is indeed in control of our lives and that Jesus is our only way to God. We need to make worship a priority in our weekly timetable. We need to make sure that we give a fitting proportion of our time, talent and money so that the church can do all the things that God wants it to do. And we need to be more prepared to tell people that we are Christians and that we are proud to be members of the family of God. And I know that I am preaching in the main to the converted. That you are the people who come regularly to church. You do come to the Bible studies. And you do give of your time, talent and money to the work of the church. The real challenge for you is to encourage those members who do not do these things. Your challenge is to get the message of these parables over to our non-attending members. Our non-praying members. Our non-working members. That unless they start using their God-given gifts, they will lose them. And their membership of this church will mean nothing whatsoever. It's up to each and every one of us here today to go out and find the lost sheep of this congregation. And to lead them back to the fold. So that their gifts and talents might be used in building God's kingdom here and there. When we are faithful in these small things, God will bless us in ways that are far beyond all our wildest hopes and dreams for this kirk and this congregation. And the third and final lesson has to do with the ideas of reward and punishment. 
In both stories, the servants who worked hard and used their talents to the best of their abilities were rewarded with more work to do. Too often in the church, Christians assume that once they've completed a task, that they can sit back and relax and let someone else take on the responsibility of doing the work. They've done their bit. It's now up to someone else. These stories challenge us to rethink that mindset. They challenge us to remember that it is the souls of people that we are dealing with. The eternal lives of people that we are responsible for. And that we cannot just decide that we've done enough. And let someone else do the work of saving those souls for us. The reason that this and every other church exists is to point people on the road to heaven. And to help them get there. And until every man, woman and child in the world is safely on the way to eternal life, then no Christian should ever feel that they've done their bit. Because there is still work to be done. Turn the point around. The church, the task of the church, is to stop people going to hell. And as you go about your daily lives, look at the people you work with, or the people you relax with, or the members of your family, and ask yourself if you want that person to go to heaven or to hell. And if you want to see them go to heaven and they're not a Christian, then you still have work to do. And that is what Jesus is trying to teach us in these two stories. That there is always more work to be done, more souls to be saved. And when we show God that we are capable of good things, he will reward us with bigger and more important tasks to perform. But these stories also warn us of the consequences of not working for God or trying to find the easy life. In both accounts, the people who simply hid their talents and returned them unused to their master lost even the little talent that they had. The little that they had was taken from them because they had not even tried. Think of any skill you might have received from God. If you do not practice it, you will soon lose the ability. When we stop using the gifts that God has given us, that is when even the little faith we begin with will be taken from us. God doesn't mind if we try something and fail. He will reward our effort as long as we have given of our best. What angers him is when he sees us squandering and wasting the skills and talents He has entrusted to us. And don't be under any illusion. God will punish those who do not put their talents to work. Of saving the souls of others. So as we come to the end. We see that each of us has been given different talents by God. And that he trusts us to use them wisely to build his kingdom. And we see that God will often test us. To see if we are ready for more responsibility. And we see that God will reward those who work hard. And that he will punish the lazy. There's no standing still in the Christian faith. If you do not go forwards, then you go backwards. It's use it or lose it. So let's make sure that no one in the old kirk of air goes backwards. But that we all go forward together. And that together we are blessed by the Lord God Almighty for all that we have achieved in his name and through his power. Amen. And may God add his blessing to these thoughts and to his name be the praise and the glory. Let's worship God with our offering.
Let us pray. Father God, you do indeed give us many gifts. And today is a token of our love and appreciation for all that you have done for us and all that you will do for us. We bring this our offering before you. Accept, bless and use it that your kingdom might grow. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Now I'd like to ask Helen to lead us in prayer. Let's pray together. We come before you, Lord, with grateful hearts. Thank you for the blessings you have bestowed in our lives. You've provided us with more than we could ever have imagined. You have surrounded us with people who always look out for us. You have given us family and friends who bless us every day with kind words and actions. Heavenly Father, we thank you for food, but remember the hungry. We thank you for health, but remember the sick. We thank you for friends, but remember the lonely. We thank you for freedom, but remember those who are being controlled. We thank you for our peace, but remember those in war-torn conflicts. May these remembrances stir us to serve you by using our gifts to help those in need. We bring before you those in our neighbourhoods and in our church. May we follow you, help and influence others for the good. Let us be the salt and light pointing others to you. Deepen our love for you and for the people around us. Guard us from hypocrisy or from giving in to temptation that could harm the cause of Christ. Turn our hearts towards our families so that they may turn towards you. Help us to exemplify your values and make us bold in our faith. Strengthen our families, Lord, and bring them closer to you. Lord, we come to you today to pray for our world. May our love for you help us to love and forgive others and make a difference in our world. We pray that you give us all we pray that you give all of us the strength and insight to overcome our battles. We pray for the weak, those who suffer, the sick, the poor, the distressed, the lonely, the unloved, the persecuted, the unemployed those who grieve. Be also with all those who care for them. Comfort and heal them, Lord, and help them to find your peace. Lord, thank you for your amazing power and work in our lives. Thank you for your goodness and for your blessings over us. Thank you for your great love and care. Thank you for your sacrifice so that we might have freedom and life. Forgive us when we don't thank you enough for who you are and for what you do and for all you have given us. Help us to set our eyes and our hearts on you afresh. Renew our spirits, fill us with your peace and joy. We love you and we need you this day and every day. In Jesus' name, Amen. Thank you. Just before we sing a closing hymn, can I remind you to put your name on the sheet for the treasure hunt if you haven't already done so. We're going to close with You Shall Go Out With Joy and we'll sing it through twice.
now may grace, mercy and peace from God the Father, God the Son and God the Holy Spirit be with you and all those you love now and evermore. and keep safe.